Okay, now we check the few claims, uh, similar as the case we we did for constraint, uh, equally constraint optimization problem. So now we consider uh, the first claim. I'm going to make the first claim. Uh, so similar as before, we're going to show that the norm of the uh, Jacobian of UA at this at any point in the neighborhood of W star will be bounded by some number we call the kappa a, which is between zero and one. Okay, so here is a similar as before. Uh, we have this W star, and suppose that the gradient or the Jacobi of U a at x star is less than one. This is what we showed previously, right? We showed that this is less than one. So that means there exists some kappa between zero and one. And also there exists a eta that is uh, the radius of this ball, such that for any points in this ball, the uh, the Jacobian of UA at this point WA. So WA is the the you know the x and the mu a part of the w is going to be less than kappa a. Okay, so this is the uh, we know that this is always this must be true because the the this one is continuous. Okay, so if it's this, say if it's point a, as we said, this is, say it's point seven, this one is equal to point seven, then in the neighborhood all these values are going to be less than equal to 0.8, for example. It depends on how you choose this data. Okay, so that's similar as before. Okay, uh, so I will not go through the proof. As I said, the uh, proof is almost identical to, to the case with, uh, with the equality constraints. Um, now I'm going to uh, define several quantities uh, that are, that's going to be useful for proof uh, uh, in the next few claims. The first one is we're going to define this um, kappa here. So this kappa is different from this kappa a. So it's just some some kappa number uh, that is the maximum value of one. And uh, this say uh, this is uh, uh, the maximum value of this gw. Remember the gw. The gw tells you gives you the Jacobian. Of some point between W and the W star. Okay, so if you have W here and W star here, this GW is just a Jacobian such that, remember, such that the uh, U of W equals to U of W star or minus U of W star equals to G of W times W minus W star. We know that this exists uh, due to the mean value theorem. So this is how the G is set. Uh, G is defined. But anyway, that we can define the G of W star to be our uh, G of W to be this. So it must be actually this must be um, this will be some positive number. So you take the supremum over this ball, which is a closed ball, uh, centered at the omega star, W star and the eta. And uh, you take the uh, if this is bigger than one. The maximum of this is bigger than one, you just take it. If this is a big maximum of this one is smaller than one, you just take one. Okay, but anyway, this kappa will be a number greater than equal to one. So this is remember that this is kappa different from the kappa we had earlier, which is some number like this kappa a, which is, is less than one. But this kappa is bigger than one. So that's one. And then we can choose that the epsilon small enough such that this quantity is less than uh, uh, delta. Okay. Well, Oh, by the way, sorry, I, I didn't mention that. We do have this easily because this uh, uh, this quantity is less than kappa, less than one at the, the W star, so it's less than that. Uh, so that's how this one is, uh, this one holds. How this one holds is because at X star, at the, sorry, at the W star, the, uh, the, the GI will be negative. So what it does it mean is, Say we have that W star equals to X star lambda star. And uh, no matter what, I know that the, the W star, uh, or I should say in this way, I should say it in this way. This is the X star. And uh, this is a, 
is on the uh, interior of the inactive of the set is characterized by inactive constraints. I know that the g i of x star is less than zero. Okay, because it's less than zero, I know that if I move around near the x star here will be still make still less than zero. So it's less than zero means that it's just a finite it's a finite dimensional vector. It's less than zero means that every component is strictly less than zero. And let's say that uh, they are all less than negative delta. All of them are less than or equal to negative delta. So in this case I know that within this neighborhood the all the points are all this G I of X is going to be less than not just a negative like it not just a um, negative vector, but it's actually less than or equal to the negative delta times e. E is the vector of all the ones. This is the this is the e. Okay, so it just means that the largest components of this is negative delta, or less than or equal to negative delta. Okay, and this is also true as long as we're close, we're near the uh, the W star, uh, which has the x star and the lambda star. Then within this neighborhood, all the x also have also satisfies this. This is again because of the continuity of the g. Okay, so that's how we get this delta. Now we have several values. So we know the delta. We can determine the delta. We can determine the eta. Well, these are all determined theoretically. We don't really have a way to compute what exactly their values are. Okay, it's pretty. It's really. Uh, it can be really difficult or even impossible to compute their values, but we know the existence of such values. All right, so uh, from there, we continue the discussion. We said there exists some epsilon, small enough, such that epsilon times this kappa, kappa is this value right here, which is bigger than one. Uh, and this alpha is uh, alpha is a step size, delta is this number, not a very small positive number. We know that when we choose epsilon small enough, this one can be arbitrary small. The reason is, you know, when you choose our epsilon going to zero, this one goes to one. And this one, as you choose epsilon going to zero, this goes to zero. So you can make this arbitrarily small, right? By choosing a epsilon extremely small. You can make this arbitrarily small. So definitely it will be smaller than uh, this eta up to some point. Okay, that's our eta. And then we choose this k0, which is an integer, uh, to be this. So this is just epsilon over uh, alpha delta, so it's a positive number. Okay, And uh, this means the, the smallest integer that is bigger than or equal to this number. Okay, For example, if this number you got is 5.7, then taking this gives you 6. Okay, the smallest integer that is bigger than or equal to this number here. So that's our k0. And then let's say that our w0 or w0 starts from some point uh, in the ball centered as w star and uh, uh, the epsilon. Okay, and we know that this epsilon will be less than eta because this number is greater than or equal to one. So if epsilon or epsilon times this number is less than eta, the epsilon itself is less than eta. So if we start from some uh, so this length is epsilon. So if you start some w0, then we're going to show that the sequence generated by the Lagrange algorithm will converge to the W star. So you start from here, then uh, you know, we will show that they converge, you have a general sequence that converge to W star. Okay, so how do we show this? Uh, this is going to be the uh, a few claims we're going to make, and that would be useful for us to show that. Uh, the second claim I'm going to make is that if uh, the k is less than k naught, so this is actually k naught the iteration number, telling us uh, up to this point the uh, the mu i. So remember that we have x, right? We have the x and add the mu as the iterates. So uh, to up to this point, up to this point, will be guaranteed that this mu. Which contains the active part and the inactive part is guaranteed that this part will become zero. Okay, it doesn't matter how you start from the x to the mu as long as it's as is close to a uh, double star, in the sense that 
and the w0 is in here okay so this in includes the uh, sorry the includes the x0 and uh, and the mu0 okay and if we start from nearby the x a double star then uh, by the iteration number k0 we can show that up uh, before the iteration number k0 we can show that this is true okay uh, so this could be w0 w1 w2 up to wk0 and here this is epsilon and this is the kappa that we define is uh, is bigger than or equal to one this k is the iteration number so when k is from 0 to k0 k0 uh, we have this okay this is the second claim we're going to make and then we're going to do this by uh, induction we first show that this is true for k equals to zero and then we do the induction so uh, obviously it's true for zero k equals zero because when k equals to zero we just have this as zero and this k as zero so it's going to be this less than equal to epsilon uh, and that is the assumption we made we require this double zero to be in that range and uh, then assume that this is true for k for some k and then we want to, we're going to show that this is also true for k plus one well to show this is true for k plus one pretty easy similar as before we know that this is going to be less than or equal to this this is the because of the uh, similar property we had uh, before or similar derivation we had before because this is a uh, according to the definition this is equal to pi of uh, uh, uwk minus pi of w uh, pi of u of w star okay this equals to this, this is because the lagrange algorithm we're using this is equal to this because w star is a fixed point Okay. and then uh, there is a property about this projection if we have uh, some set omega and this as long as convex and uh, closed we mean by closed is closed set you know that from analysis I believe, I believe. Um, as long as convex and closed then the projection of any point onto, onto omega minus the projection of, of another point this distance must be less than or equal to x minus 1 okay so what that means is say you have this omega here you have a point x you have a point y the projection of them will be this and this and the distance between these two will be less than the distance less than or equal to the distance between the original dis uh, distance uh, between x and y so this point is pi of x right here this pointer here is pi of y. Okay, so this is called non-expensive. Non-expensive. Expensive feature of this uh, projection. Okay, as long as omega is uh, convex closed, then we have this. While right now we have uh, this omega equal to the uh, partly the first quadrant, right? It should be, this is actually equal to r n times by r p plus so this is the convex set so it's like that we're taking say this side so it's a convex set right if n and p are both positive uh well if n and p are both positive we're actually we're taking this right so it's a convex set the yeah so that's why this one here is equal is less than or equal to uh, the distance without the pi, which is u of w k minus u of uh, w star, and then we're going to use the fact that the definition of g, so this is g of w k times w k minus w star. Okay, and then we can show that this is less than or equal to. That's how we continue. This is less than or equal to this. Right, because of the matrix norm to our definition of matrix norm so we have that and because it's a wk is still near the neighborhood uh, 
and then we know that this is less than or equal to kappa. And on the other hand, this is less than or equal to, uh, this is equal to that, we'll keep it. But according to the induction hypothesis, we'll assume that this is less than or equal to, this is true for k. So that means that this is less than or equal to that. And then uh, you have these two, so you have one k kappa here, and then you have kappa to the power k here. You can just have this, uh, multiply them together, you have this. So this shows that this is also true for k equals to, for k, k plus one. Okay, that uh, completes the induction. Okay, and uh, remember that when k, well, when k gets, gets larger and larger, this number is getting larger and larger, but this kappa is also greater than one. So potentially this is getting larger and larger, but we only care about the case when the, the k is less than the k naught. So before k, uh, before when k is still less than k naught, uh, due to the definition of your of our uh, k naught, we chose the k naught this large, so that it is guaranteed that this quantity is still less than eta. Okay, because this is how we define. Oh, sorry, it's still less than. Um, Yeah, still less than eta. Um, let me see. Uh, we know that this is less than eta. Because, uh, let me see how we chose the... Yeah, so because we choose this k0 to be number bigger than this, so that means this times kappa k0 is less than or equal to um, is less than or equal to eta. Okay, so um, I guess that's how we we're going to, well, I think we can choose the eta even smaller. Uh, although this number is slightly bigger than that, but we can still, we can just choose the epsilon, uh, epsilon to be small enough so that when you run this to the, the uh, next large, next integer, this is still less than epsilon, uh, it's still less than eta. And this how shows that this is going to be less than eta. Okay? So that's how we, if this is, this is always true, but this one is always less than eta due to the choice of k. If k is less than, oh yeah, actually this is the case. So um, the k is still less than, yeah, less than equal to k naught. So uh, the largest value we can get, larger value we can get it from here is just, uh, so this will be less than equal to uh, epsilon kappa k naught, since k is less than equal to k naught, and the kappa is greater than one. And then we know that we chose this epsilon small enough so that this is less than eta. Okay, so that's how we get this one. And then we're going to make uh, the next claim. The claim here is that when we look at when we look at the the mu i parts. Remember that we have the x, k, mu a k, and then we have this uh, mu i k. This is my w k. Okay, I'm going to show that this one will decay to zero by the time k equals to k naught. Okay, so we have the one iteration number one, two, all the way to k naught. And then we are going to claim that when we do the iteration up to this point, this quantity must be zero. It will be completely a zero vector. And the first thing we're going to show that is going to decrease. So you may start from some non-negative vector, because that has to be a non-negative value. 
and uh, when time go on, then uh, when iteration goes on, then we'll have this decay to zero. Okay, to show that it's decaying pretty easy, um, because we know that this uh, inner neighborhood, we know that this gi of xk is less than or equal to negative delta e. So this is completely a negative vector with uh, the largest component less than or equal to negative delta. Okay, so that's why when you compute the mu i according to this, this is the how we, this is just this portion of the Lagrange algorithm. If you look at this, this quantity is going to be less than or equal to negative delta e. Okay, and uh, you have this less than or equal to that, so you take the positive, it's still less than or equal to that. Right? Uh, that's pretty obvious, right? You have uh, any vector say x is less than or equal to y, then you take the positive of x and it will be less than or equal to positive of y. That's pretty easy to show. Okay, so that's why this is true. And then this, um, this is going to be less than the mu i itself because this is a negative value right here. This is a negative value. So if you subtract it, the best case is that you make it zero, right? If you make it, you become negative, you do this, you become some components become negative, negative then uh, you run it to zero. Then it definitely is, uh, this is already greater than equal to zero everywhere, every component. So this must be greater than that. Well, if it's, you decrease it, it's still positive, then the origin is even bigger. So you subtract, you subtract by some positive number, it's still positive. Then uh, the, just means that the original component in there is even bigger. So that's why this is also less than that. Okay, and this shows that the uh, mu i k plus one is less than or equal to mu i k, uh, so component wisely. So that means this mu i components in mu i uh, is decreasing, or it's not increasing. Okay, so that's that's one. The other one is that we're going to show uh, after this point, all those uh, all these components should be zero. All these components should be zero. Okay, and to show this, uh, let's prove it by contradiction. Suppose that when k is bigger than k naught. But we still have some of these components uh, uh, greater than zero. Then uh, we can see that uh, if that component is still zero, uh, still positive, it's not zero yet. Then what happens is uh, for the uh, k zero, this component is equal to, according to our definition, uh, it is equal to this plus this. Remember that we did the positive of this. We we'll get that. Well, uh, if we get we did the positive, it's, we got a positive value here. That just means that this one itself is already positive. So if we take the positive of that, it's just itself. Okay, so that's just this. And uh, similarly, all these things are positive. So uh, all the mu i component, you just uh, look at the ith component, all of them are positive for k less than k naught. So that's why we always can write this and then keep writing that uh, this decreases to zero and then we Every time we decrease k, uh, then we will get one more term of this. So that's why we have all these terms. But these terms, we know that every one of them is every one of them is less than or equal to negative delta. So that's why this whole thing is going to be less than or equal to this times alpha times negative delta, uh, and there are a total of k zero of them. So that's why it's less than or equal to this. All right, and. Uh, this, we're going to claim that this is less than epsilon minus this quantity. That means we know this is going to be less than epsilon. The reason is, we started from some point, W naught, whose distance to W star is less than or equal to delta, less than or equal to epsilon. And this is going to be less, greater than or equal to this, since this is merely a, com a component, merely a component of this. Okay, since the corresponding mu W i star is equal to zero, since uh, at the i is this one of the inactive uh, index indices. So this must be zero, and uh, then we have this w uh, i zero. Well, you have when you have a vector x, you know that this is bigger than or equal to any components or x i, right? Because this is equal to the x one square all the way to x n square. So it's definitely bigger than or equal to any specific x i. And that's what happens here. Uh, you have this vector, and the vector norm must be bigger than or equal to 
the uh, value of each co the specific component here. This must be greater than zero, so I don't put the absolute value there. But this is less than epsilon, so that's why this is less than epsilon. That's how I got this is less than that. Well, and this must be less than equal to zero because of the reason we chose this epsilon. Um, so the reason we chose this k0, because it's k0 was set to be bigger than or equal to this. So k0 is going to be bigger than or equal to epsilon over alpha delta. And that's why that's why we have this less than equal to zero. Okay, so uh, in the well you won't have this, we showed that we'll have this, we showed that the epsilon is uh, going to be less than this. And uh, um, um, Uh, I should say that this is the big, sorry, uh, this, is, this is not correct. So this is bigger than zero, okay? And this implies that, this implies that uh, zero is less than epsilon over, uh, minus alpha delta k zero. And this implies that the k zero is less than epsilon over alpha delta. And this is a contradiction to the choice of k zero because we chose the k0 to be the number integer greater than equal to that. But uh, assuming this is a greater than zero, we end up with the k0 less than that. So that's a contradiction. That means uh, there's no way to find any of this bigger than zero. So all of them must be equal to zero. Okay, so for all the i's, this uh, mu i k0 should be equal to zero. And this implies that uh, up to the point uh, k0, the uh, all this part will be become zero. So the mu i is corresponding to the inactive constraints uh, will be zero. Okay, and uh, the last claim, uh, the last claim I'm going to make is that uh, the, the actually we are going to make three claims. The first one is that uh, we consider the case when iteration number is bigger, less than or equal to k zero. But the continue the iteration will continue, right? Then when, what happens when k is bigger than k zero? Well, what it says here is that this component will stay at zero. This will stay at zero. Okay, uh, we show that this will be equal to zero when k is equal to k naught, and this just means that it will stay at zero. And uh, the next two, uh, we are going to show that our w k is still within the neighborhood of w star uh, in the ball centered at w star with the radius eta. And also the last one is going to show us the convergence. This is less than or equal to kappa a times this. This is similar to the equality constraint case. Okay, we're going to show this three. Uh, again, we're going to do this by uh, by induction. Assume this. Uh, so we first show that these three are true for k equals to k naught, and then we we'll assume that these are k for some k bigger than k naught, bigger than or equal to k naught, and then we show the case for k plus one. Well, to show the first two, when this is k naught, we show this is equal to zero already. And also we show this, when this is k naught, this is less than or equal to epsilon, uh, eta, so we, we know this is also true. This is the, by the previous two claims. And then we just need to show this for k equals to k naught. So let's see what happens when k equals to k naught. So when this k equals to k naught, this is that. And uh, uh, according to what we just derived, this is equal to this. Right, due to the definition for this by using the Lagrange algorithm, and then this we apply the projection is less than or equal to the one that we do not apply it, and then this is less than or equal to this, similar as before, and then this is less than or equal to kappa a, so that's why we have that. Okay, and this shows that the last equation, the last inequality holds for k equals to k naught, and now. Um, 
we actually can, before we do the deduction, we actually can see that since this part is already zero, okay, and then we look at, uh, then we look at the uh, k greater than k there, not. Suppose that this is still equal to zero, suppose this is still equal to zero, I'm going to show that the uh, mu i k plus one is still, uh, stays at zero. Okay, to show that, we uh, first re recall that this is less than negative delta E, right? Uh, for WK near the neighborhood, we know that this is less than equal to delta E. So according to the, the iteration of the Lagrange algorithm, this is equal to that for the ith, uh, for the inactive uh, uh, index, indices. And this is less than equal to this. Okay, so that means this is this is equal to zero. This is less than equal to this. So that's why the positive of that is less than equal to the positive of this. But here you can see this is a complete negative vector. You take the positive, which is equal to zero. So that means this will be again zero vector. Okay, and this also shows that uh, this is true. Okay, what is this? what is this? Uh, this is equal to the middle one. Other uh, the left one is this. It's the x k plus one uh, w a k sorry mu a k plus one. Minus x star and uh, mu a star. This is the left hand side. The right hand side is actually this. What I'm going to claim is that this true is this two are actually equal. So what is this? You just uh, pad this uh, mu i. Now you can actually see why these two are equal. Is it because although you have longer vector here compared to the two vectors here, but this is just zero. This is just zero. So you make the difference and take the norm. It's the same as you just take the difference of these two and then take the norm. Okay, so that's why this is true. For all k greater than or equal to k naught, this is because for k greater than or equal to k naught, these are always zero. Okay, and that's the property we're going to use uh, below. Uh, we remember that we are going to show that these two are also true, assuming k this is true are true for k for some k greater than or equal to k naught, then this will be also true for k plus one. Okay, and uh, for the last one, let's check the w a k plus two will be equal to this according to the iteration of Lagrange algorithm, and then we take the difference of these two. It will be easy to, as, just as before, we can show that this is less than or equal to that. And this uh, is multiplied to some number between 0 and 1, so it's definitely maybe going to be less than this. And that verifies, first verifies this one. And next, because this will be just equal to the one without A, as we showed here. This two will be, will be equal uh, with or without A, oh, right? So that's why this is just the, the same one as without A. And also, this is the same as the without a. But if this is less than or equal to abs, less than or equal to uh, eta, according to our assumption, or induction of hypothesis, then this will be less than or equal to eta. And you multiply some number is still less than or equal to eta. I'm considering the case without a here because this with with or without a they are the same. And this finishes the claim. And now you can see that uh, well, where is it? Yeah, you look at this, this store uh, iterates. So what it says is that uh, up to some point to k0, this term will, this will become zero completely and stay at zero. And the, this part, this part compared to the uh, w star, their distance is going to be shrinking according to this constant. This constant is between zero and one. So that tells us that it is it's going to zero linearly fast okay, at a linear rate. So that's claim. That's finished the claim. Okay, and uh, um, sorry, this should be again. Yet. 
Okay, so what is we have shown that at this point, uh, if we start, we show this uh, local convergence. When we start from somewhere near the W star, and W star is a regular K KT point, and uh, this is the this Haitian is a positive definite there, then as long as we start from somewhere nearby, the W star is guaranteed that the algorithm will give us a convergence sequence to a W star. But this, as we said, this is a local convergence, so it's pretty weak in the sense that uh, we have to start with somewhere very close to the W star. In the, the, all these numbers, the, like the radius, uh, all these things are, you know, we only show that they exist, but they could be extremely small. And you know, it's pretty, you know, it would be really difficult to, uh, to choose some W star that close to W0, uh, w that close to W star. So it, it only has, I would say that it only has a um, theoretical value um, that gives us some confidence. But in practice, I don't think this is really that useful. Um, but unfortunately, probably that's the best we can get uh, so far for since the problem is really general. But uh, the point right now is that there, we learned several techniques in the proofs, and they could be very useful if you say if you're going to uh, you have you have an algorithm that's uh, going to apply to a specific question, or you want to develop uh, new algorithms for a certain type of algorithm for a certain type of problems. These proof techniques will be similar, and they, in those cases, you probably can show a better convergence result, probably even global convergence result. For example, if the problem is convex, uh, you already can show by using the same trick. We actually can show that. Uh, the, com the, the convergence will be global, the meaning that you can start from anywhere. It doesn't have to be near the KKD point. From anywhere, you convert to a KKD point. So the, com the proof trick will be similar, or proof technique will be similar. But it's just that we're considering a really general uh, problem here, so that's the best claim we can make. Okay, so the last uh, pro uh, method I'm going to introduce is called the penalty method, uh, which actually is much easier to do or conceptually, it's much easier to do. So the idea is pretty simple, is that we are minimizing a objective function subject to the set constraint. So I just need to make sure the x is in the set. Okay, but this is different from the uh, the uh, projection projected gradient method we discussed that earlier, because this omega we write this as x in omega, but as omega can be really general. For example, we can define the omega to be this. Right? Then this is equivalent to the inequality constraint the optimization problem we just mentioned. Okay? So this is in a very conceptually it's in a very general form, and uh, you can include any constraint optimization problem because you can just throw in throw all the constraint into this omega set. But uh, this set could be really complicated to describe, or it's really difficult to project it to. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so suppose we have a problem with this, and uh, we can introduce uh, a penalty. So instead of minimizing this with the constraint, let's say we do this penalty method, meaning that if x is in omega, then we do not penalize it at all. We can just miss, simply minimize f of x. But if x is not in the set, then we're going to impose some penalty. So this penalty function is called p of x. It tells that if x is already in omega, then this is equal to zero. If it's outside of omega, this will be positive then you put a penalty weight, uh, gamma. And then, in this case, you can see that when we minimize this, then they will prefer prefer those x that do not incur any penalty, meaning that the px is equal to zero. So, and then hopefully you can just minimize this. Okay, so that's the uh, penalty method. So we're going to give a few examples soon later. So first, uh, let's formalize the definition of a penalty function. We call a function a penalty function, call this p a penalty function if it's mapping any x to some uh, non-negative real number, and uh, if this p is continuous, and it's greater than or equal to zero for any x, this means that it's mapping to a non-negative value, and it is equal to zero if and only if x is already inside the omega or x is already feasible. Okay, so for example, uh, say we have. Uh, we define the omega to be this set, which means it's just the inequality constraint that we have. Uh, omega contains all the points x such that gx is less than or equal to zero. 
And in this case, how we how are we going to define this penalty function? We said that if it's gx is already less than zero, less than or equal to zero, we do not put any constraint, uh, put any penalty. That means in those cases, the px is equal to uh, the px should be equal to zero. And if this one is bigger than zero, if any of these components is bigger than zero, then we're going to incur some penalty. And the penalty is defined in this way. So what this is, remember that we have this gx equal to g1x all the way to gpx. Okay, and this is less than equal to zero. Uh, we want this to be true. But if any one of them, for example, if g1 is positive, then we're going to consider this g1x, which is equal to, or this positive, which is equal to maximum of 0 and g1x. Well, if g1x is less than or equal to 0, the maximum of this will be 0. So it's fine. We do, not we do not penalize it a lot at all. If g1 of x is greater than 0, then the maximum of this will be equal to the g1 of x. And in this case, we're going to add this to the penalty function. So that's the, the, the first term. Okay, and we're going to do this for all the p components. And we simply add them up. You can do this, or you can do an even stronger penalty. So if it's bigger than one, uh, bigger than uh, uh, 0, then we're going to square this. We're going to put a square of it. So the larger you the more positive this value is, the gi of x is, the stronger the penalty is. Okay, so let's see an example. Suppose I have this gx. Right now the x is a scalar, uh, also only as a scalar. The g has two functions, g1x and g2x. Uh, let's say that the g1x is this, x minus two. The g2x is uh, this. And now let's consider the constraint set. I want to look at, I'm looking at the, all the points uh, x such that the g1 of x is less than equal to 0 and the g2 of x is less than equal to 0. Okay, we actually can easily solve for this uh, because I, we just need to find the omega just uh, contains all the points such that this is less than equal to 0 and also this is less than equal to 0. We can actually solve for that. Um, but that's not our goal. We can, uh, we, we want to uh, define penalty functions according to our choice here. Let's see what happens uh, when we choose the penalty function, say, especially in this first way. How are we going to how this uh, penalty function looks like? Well, it looks like it looks like this. We're going to choose the g1 plus. Um, the g1 plus, as we said, it's just a maximum of zero and g1. So g1 is this. So when this is negative then we just take a value of 0, or when it is negative. Apparently, it's when x is less than equal to 2, it will be less than equal to 0. And in this case, this is less than equal to 0, so taking the maximum it will become 0. Okay, so that's the case here, this case. Well, uh, if this x is greater than 2, then uh, the g1 of x will be greater than 0, and then taking the maximum of these two will be just the g1. Uh, which is this. Okay, so that's the case where x is bigger than 2, then we take this value. So that's, that's our g1 plus. And similarly, you can do the g2 plus. So we just comp take the maximum of 0 and g2. You will see that when the x is uh, uh, bigger than negative 1, this will be less than or equal to 0. And in this case, the value will be 0. And then if x is uh, uh, less than negative 1, then this value will be positive. In this case, we'll just put the the g2 here, uh, then it will be this. And then the p of x will be just the sum of these two, okay, just sum of these two. And then you can see that taking the sum of these two, uh, you get this value. So what it looks like is this. So the first g1 plus is, say this is 2, 1, 0, negative 1. Uh, when it is less than equal to 0, it will be just 0. And then when it's bigger than 0, it's x minus 2. So it's this. Okay, so this is a G1 plus. That means this is G1 plus. Okay, now let's look at the G2 plus. G2 plus is when x is bigger than negative 1, it stays at 0. And when x is less than negative 1, it becomes this. 
So this is actually uh, looks like this. So it starts from negative one, and uh, it will go like this. Okay, so x minus x plus one cube is like this. So the the p x is like that. Okay, this is our p of x. You take the sum of these two, it will be just this. Okay, and apparently you can, as you can see, when the x is between negative one and two, the p of x is zero. Uh, we don't incur any penalty because this is where uh, the x. This is actually the omega. This part is the side omega. When it's inside omega, you just take a value zero. When it's outside, then you take start to take some positive values. Okay, that's our p x. Okay, so this is our penalty function, and apparently what it means is if you add this to f of x, as we did here. Then when x is already in the omega, then you just can simply minimize f of x as we did here, as we wanted here. But if p of x is x is not in the uh, in omega, then this will be a positive number, and it depends on how much weight you want to put on it. It will be penalize, penalizing the you know the the violation. Uh, and in this case, you try to will minimize this. It will take this into consideration. You don't want this to be my, um, large. Especially when your gamma is getting larger and larger, you definitely don't want to put your x outside of omega. Okay. All right. Let's uh, look at another example. Um, so we have, uh, say, we consider this problem where uh, we have this quadratic function to minimize, and that the constraint is that the norm is equal to one. The norm of x is equal to one, so we can consider the penalty. For example, we consider the penalty, penalty function to be this: uh, when the x norm is equal to one, then this is zero, so it's okay. And uh, when x is not the norm of x is not equal to one, then this will be non-zero, and the square root will be a positive number. Okay, so that's how we define our penalty function here. And uh, then we can consider the uh, the penalty method. We have this as our f of x, as this one. And then this as our px gamma times px, which is this one here. Okay, and then uh, let's say that for some fixed gamma, we're going to minimize this. Uh, then this becomes a uh, unconstrained problem. Well, for which case we can just directly consider the first order necessary condition. We can take the gradient and set it to zero and see what is the minimum value, or what is the critical value there. While well, we do that, so the critical gradient of this. Uh, the first term gives us 2qx, as we did before many times, right? And uh, we take the gradient of this becomes, we did the chain rule, you get 2 times gamma times this inside, and then times another 2 cat, 2x, because you're going to take the gradient of this. So altogether, we get this, and this x gamma denotes the solution, uh, or the point that satisfies the first order necessary condition when this uh, is set to gamma. You change the gamma, you could change the problem, right? And then potentially you'll get a different value. Or you expect to get a different value. But anyway, that this should be equal to zero if x gamma is a critical point. And then you can just move around. You cancel this two with the number two here, and uh, you can move this whole thing to the right, and then becomes this. This q of x gamma, q times x gamma equals to this times x gamma. So I call this one lambda some number lambda, and this will be, uh, uh, I call this whole thing lambda gamma. So then there will be lambda gamma times x gamma. Well, this is what happens if we uh, minimize this, and the critical point x gamma should be, should be, uh, should satisfy this. And this means that x gamma is a, well, it's a eigenvalue, right? This should be an eigenvalue of q. Well, it's eigenvalue of q, and Q is a positive symmetric positive definite matrix. Its eigenvalue of Q means that this is, must be bigger than one, a uh, bigger than zero, and it's smaller than the largest eigenvalue of Q, which is lambda max. So I know that this value should be less than should be between this, uh, should be within this range, and uh, this is our lambda gamma. So this just means the lamb this quantity is less than or equal to lambda max. Okay. And uh, if this is less than equal to lambda max, what happens is, first of all, um, uh, all the eigenvalues are uh, non-negative, 
are positive. So that means this is, should be a positive number. So the gamma is positive. It's a weight we put, a pen, uh, penalty weight we, we have. So it's positive. So this is positive means that this is positive. This thing is positive. That's why this, we have this one here. On the, on the other hand, I know that this equals to this, and that is less than or equal to this. So we can just divide two gamma on both sides. Then we end up with this is less than that. Okay, so what this tells us is that this lambda max is some property of Q. It doesn't change. Uh, but the gamma is something we chose uh, to, to, to minimize this unconstrained problem. Okay, this is the penalty, uh, benefit of doing this penalty method. We convert a constrained optimization into a unconstrained problem, uh, which is supposed to be easier to solve. And we can apply the algorithm we did develop before. And if it's differentiable than the gradient methods, we can you can use the gradient method before. But we'll see a pitfall soon later. Uh, but anyway, that we know that in this case, one minus that will be uh, decaying uh, as this gamma increases. But the, this value is always greater than zero, as you can see. So we will never reach to a, a actual feasible point. We can only reach to a point that is that is close to clo or approximately satisfying this. Like this one is not zero; it's never zero, but it's decaying to zero at the rate of this. So you put this gamma large, larger gamma, then you are supposed to get a closer uh, value to zero. That means that this one is approximately equal to zero. Okay, so whenever so that means we we solve the, we use the penalty method. To com and convert a constrained minimization problem here into an unconstrained one, then it doesn't matter what how large this gamma is, we we never get a really feasible point x because the this is never equal to one or this is never equal to one. It's always smaller than that one, but uh, the distance to one is uh, getting closer and closer and it's smaller and smaller as gamma increases. Okay. Um, so, so the strategy is as we said, uh, we can first uh, we want want to convert a constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained one. Then we first decide what is the penalty function, uh, as we did before, and then we just put some weight we call the gamma k to this, and then we solve this for gamma k, uh, solve this for the x. And uh, the xk, we denote it by the argument of this unconstrained optimization problem with this as a constraint, with this as an objective function. And then we increase the gamma k and do this again. And then I want to see that this is eventually going closer and closer to the true solution. Okay? Uh, or to the solution of the constrained minimization problem. Okay. Um, well, when we do this, this is our... Uh, main iteration. It appears that why we not why not just choose a super large gamma, and then we just solve for that one, uh, because it seems that you're doing this, and that the xk has nothing to do with your with your xk plus one. Well, the key is that when you do this right here, we minimize this. You cannot that do it just with one step, right? You have to apply some uh, minimization or unconstrained minimization problem to this to solve for the next to solve for the xk. So for doing this is because we can say we do this for we compute xk, and next time we increase this gamma k to a gamma k plus one, and then we're going to use the xk as the initial value and try to do the minimization, and then we get xk plus one, and this is supposed to be uh, better or it's called a warm start uh, because we start for, with some smaller value of gamma k and uh, smaller smaller value of gamma, and then we gradually increase it. And we use the result we we obtained by minimizing this for a specific gamma and use that as a initial value for the next uh, one. Okay, this is called a warm start. Okay, but the, pen, the idea is pretty simple. You just convert this uh, constrained optimization into this penalized uh, unconstrained optimization problem, and then gradually increase the gamma k and solve for uh, solve for x k for each fixed gamma k, and hopefully this x k will convert to uh, uh, the minimizer. So what we actually, what we are ex exactly hoping for, is that 
when we generate such a sequence using this penalty method, we hope that any accumulation point, any accumulation point is a KKT point. Okay, this is the target. Uh, what do we mean by accumulation point? So we generate a sequence. We generally cannot uh, guarantee that this one itself convert to X star. But as long as we can show that a subsequence of this, subsequence of this convex star, we're good in, it's already good enough. So accumulation point of a sequence of points means that, uh, or we say x star is a, it's called an accumulation point, or sometimes also called a limit point of the sequence if there exists a subsequence of xk such that they converge to x star. So I don't require that the whole sequence convert to x star, but uh, Hopefully, there is a subsequence of that convert to X star. Okay, now we are similarly as before. I'm going to make a few claims, and uh, and uh, from there we can say we can we can show that uh, how the accumulation we can show that accumulation point, or there exists at least one accumulation point, or any accumulation point I should say, any accumulation point of this would be a KKD point. Okay, so the claims we're going to make here are really uh, simple. Uh, the first claim is that when we, the Q, uh, Q gamma k is the one we have here, right? We put the penalized fun objective function with f of x and px, but with the penalty weight, the gamma k. This is called the Q gamma k. Uh, we solve this Q gamma k for xk, minimize the Q gamma k for xk, xk and we also minimize this for uh, with the gamma k plus 1 for this minimizer. Then it's guaranteed that, which means uh, this is bigger than that. So what I mean by that is, we minimize this function for gamma k, and then we minimize this function for gamma equals to gamma k plus one. Then the value we got uh, for the larger gamma k plus one will have will be bigger. Okay, so that means we do make this a larger number to uh, gamma k plus 1, then the minimizer of this is also bigger. Or the minimizer making this object function value uh, even bigger. Okay, so xk, as we said, is the minimizer for q gamma kx. Okay? And that means if you plug in according to this, xk is the, R, the minimizer of this. So if you plug in xk, it will be less than equal to what you plug in when you plug in other values, for example, xk plus 1. Because xk plus 1 is anyway some point that is not, not as good, or cannot be bigger, better than this, since xk is already optimal. And that is why when you plug in xk, this is going to be less than equal to this when you plug in xk plus 1. Okay, Since this is the minimizer for q gamma kx. And on the other hand, we know that this, according to uh, the uh, definition, will be the Q of gamma kx is just uh, written as x, f of x plus gamma k times p of x. And right now, x equals x k plus 1. So that's why we can just plug this in. And remember that the gamma k is an increasing sequence for pen of penalty, penalty weight, weight. So that's why this is less than or equal to k. This is true, right? So that's why this is less than or equal to this, or less than this. And this is the positive number or non-negative value. So that's why we get this inequality. And according to our definition, this is just the Q of xk plus 1, uh, xk plus 1, because they just plug in xk plus 1 uh, into the penalized objective function with this equal to gamma k plus 1. So now we have shown that this is less than that. And this is equal to this value right here, and this is less than that. Uh, it's really bigger than that, so that's why uh, we don't show that this is less than or equal to this, and that is a claim. So that's the first claim. Uh, second claim, um, we're going to show that uh, the although we're putting larger weight, when we're putting larger weight, that means we're hoping that this is closer to uh, what we const what the constraint requires for or ask for, because uh, when we plug in uh, xk plus 1, uh, the penalty will be decreased, meaning that this will violate the constraint less. Okay, and uh, that's uh, also easy to show. Again, remember that 
sk is the minimizer for q gamma k, and uh, xk plus 1 is the minimizer for the q xk gamma k plus 1. So that's why when you have the gamma k here, then you plug in this will be better than you plug in something else, for example, xk plus 1. Similarly, when you have this as gamma k plus 1, then when you plug in xk plus 1, it will be better than any other value, for example, you plug in this. So we have these two, these two inequalities. Then we just write them out because the Q, uh, we know that this is just uh, F plus uh, gamma KP, uh, where X equals to XK. Okay? And similarly, this is the same as this one, but the X uh, is XK plus 1 inside. Okay? And then we can do the second equation, and that will be this. Okay, now then we're going to just add up the two sides. We add up, I put this four together, and we put this four together. And you can realize that we have this term, this term will be cancelled they, because they, it appears on both sides. And this will be cancelled with this because they also appear on both sides. And then we can move around. We can move this to the left together with this. So that's how we get this term. And then we move this to the right together with this term. So we have that. And now you can see that both of them have these uh, terms. And uh, this term is positive because we increase the gamma k. So that's why they can be cancelled as well. And when they cancelled, we know that this is less than or equal to this. That's how we get that. So that means that if you increase the penalty weight, then the minimizer you get will violate the penalty or violate the constraint less. Okay, that's what this means. Okay, the third claim. Uh, although we make we violate the constraint less, but we also made uh, the function value bigger. Remember, I originally want to minimize it, uh, but we want to minimize the under the constraint. So although the xk plus one uh, violates the constraint less than xk, but its value increases. So sacri sacrifice uh, the uh, sacrifice something, but again, this, uh, you know, gain something, but sacrifices something as well. So what it gains is that it makes the violation of the penalty less. Uh, violation of the claim, uh, sorry, violation of the constraint less, but uh, for sacrifices that have to increase your function value a bit, because you have to, you know, we have to make it feasible. So that's why this is true. And this is pretty easy to show as well. Remember that uh, <clears throat> we showed in the first claim that this is true. So meaning that, uh, if you do this, if you use the gamma k, then you plug in xk will be smaller than that one you play plug in xk plus 1. So you write it out, will be this, according to the definition of q. And then you realize that this is actually smaller than this. Gamma k is the same. The co co coefficient will be the same, right? It's the same for both of them. But this number is, a sm is bigger than this number. But still, the sum of these two is bigger than this. And that just means that, uh, I would say that if this is bigger than that, but this whole thing is smaller than this, that just means that this is even much smaller than this. Okay, and uh, how to show that, we just need to realize this uh, right here. When we move this, uh, say so we'll move this to the left, we'll see that this will be this plus this minus this. And then we combine the common term because they both have the gamma k. So we have this. And this one is, uh, we know that it's bigger than or equal to zero. Since this one is smaller than or equal to this. So that's why this, the sum of these two is bigger than just the first term. And this shows that this is bigger than or equal to this. Okay, that's the third claim. Okay, so what do we got so far? Uh, actually, this is, this is the... The claim, what the claim two and claim three said, uh, when we gradually increase, we do this penalty method, we gradually increase the weight, then the minimizer we get will violate the constraint less, but the function value will get increase, will gradually increase. Okay, so eventually it will reach to a point that the the uh, or the sequence x k will convert to a limit point or accumulation point. Which, is set, which satisfies the constraint exactly, but the, the function value is, uh, you know, is gradually increased to a point. So uh, we we'll make sure that it's not too large, and eventually that turns out to be, to be uh, the minimizer.
Okay, right. We get to the last claim, uh, right here. So the claim right make here is that although the function value is increasing uh, as k increases, but they are always bounded by this alpha of x star, which is the optimal objective function value uh, under the constraint. So this alpha of x star is the minimum, is the optimal function value. X star is the sum of sum of the minimizers or sum of the optimal solution of the original constraint problem. Okay, and this is easy to show again because uh, alpha of x star is equal to this. The reason is that x star is feasible, so px star should be equal to zero. So you add this to gamma k p of x star, this term is just equal to zero, since so px star is equal to zero. But this becomes, this whole thing becomes the q x k x star, a q gamma k x star. And this is the no, be no better than this, because x, x k is the minimizer for q gamma k. Okay? And then we write this out, would be just this. But remember that this is bigger than or equal to zero. This is the greater than zero. So that's why this sum will be just bigger than the first term. And this shows that this is bigger than this. That means uh, when we uh, violate the constraint, when we are allowed to violate the constraint, we can get potentially smaller function value. That's uh, that's the idea. That's a pretty intuitive, right? So that's this claim. Okay, now finally we're going to show that if we're, do the, we're doing this um, uh, penalty method, then by gradually increasing the penalty weight, we can show that any uh, for each of this gamma k, we generate a minimizer x k. Uh, for any one of this gamma k, we generate a minimizer x k for the for the unconstrained problem q gamma k. Then we can show that every uh, accumulation point of this is a uh, minimizer. It's a solution to the original constraint problem. Okay, to show that, um, we just need to show that the, any uh, accumulation point of this is a solution. So let's say that we have a accumulation point uh, such that a subsequence of this convert to that accumulation point. So let's just denote this xk, uh, let's denote this uh, convergent subsequence as xk. And say that it convert to uh, x hat. We just need to show that x hat is a uh, is the solution to the original constraint problem. Well, to show that, first we realize that f of x k is less than equal to f of x star. Okay, so that's why we take the limit since this this one goes to x hat. So f of x this will go to f of x hat. So that's why this is true. But each one of this is less than f of x star. So we take the limit is still less than equal to f of x star. And this shows that f of x hat is less than equal to f of x star. Okay? And next, we're going to show that this x hat uh, is a feasible one. Okay? It's with, it's, uh, satisfies the constraint. And to show that, we first realize that this is non-decreasing. As we show that when you increase the k, this, one, this value will be uh, gradually increasing. Right, it will be gradually increasing, uh, and it's also bounded above, because in the previous claim we show that this, no matter what the k is, this is going to be less than or equal to this f of x star. So it's just that you increase the k, this one, this value will gradually increase, but uh, it is still less than or equal to that. Okay, it's just getting closer and closer to this. It's bounded above by f of x star. Okay, so this is the this is the sequence that is bounded above by f of x star. So we know that it must be convergent. You know a mountain increasing sequence with the upper bound must be convergent. So let's say that they converge to some number q star. We don't know what this q star is. Let's just say that there, but we know that there must be some number q star. So let's convert to q star. Well, uh, when they convert to q star, we can show that the gamma k times the p of x k is equal to the q minus f because this we move this to the left. That's just the definition for q. Okay, and uh, on the right hand side, we show that this convert to f of x star. Oh, uh, sorry, f of x hat. Okay, because x k goes to x hat, and also when x k goes to, when k goes to infinity, we know that this convert to the q star. Some q star we know we said earlier. So that's why this is convert to some q star. Well. 
Uh, so that means this quantity convert to a fixed number right here. But you look at this quantity, this product here, the gamma k convert to infinity, goes to infinity. But the product of this is still convert to a finite number. That means this one has to go to zero, right? If this is not going to zero, then this one together will blow up, cannot convert to a finite number. So this one has to go to zero. All right, so this, on the one hand, this goes to zero. On the other hand, uh, if p is continuous, then p of xk will convert to p of x hat. Right, since xk goes to x hat, so this will convert to p of x hat. So on the one hand, it goes to zero. On the other hand, it goes to p of x hat. That just means that the p of x hat equals to a zero. Okay, p of x hat equals zero. And this means that x hat is feasible, right? It's already satisfies the constraint. But on the other hand, we know that f of x hat is less than or equal to this. That's not, it cannot be smaller than this because this is already optimal value for all the points, for all the feasible points. But this is less than that, it just means that this value should be equal to this. And this is equal to this means that uh, the x hat satisfies the constraint, but on the other hand, it takes the same value as the minimum value or minimum possible value for a feasible point, so that means x hat. Is an optimal point. Okay, it is a solution to the original constraint problem. Okay, um, so um, the final topic was just a one small question. We will say that uh, it seems that the penalty method is pretty easy to implement. We just need to find out what is the penalty function we should use and then gradually increase the gamma, and hopefully, we can get the sequence. And hopefully the sequence has a accumulation accumulation point because that will be definitely a solution. But this seems to be also expensive because we need to do this for every gamma k. So fix the gamma k to solve it, and then do for another gamma k we need to solve it again. So this seems to be very expensive. The question is, can we do that for just a fix the gamma? K? And uh, one reason I have just explained before is that we solve this is pretty. Uh, it could be very uh, expensive to solve. It's hard to find a minimizer. That's why we do this warm start. Uh, the other thing is that um, usually this, uh, this kind of uh, penalty function is difficult to get. Uh, if we can get this kind of penalty function, then we call it the uh, exact penalty, uh, in the sense that um, we call this p a uh, exact penalty if there exists some gamma such that when you just solve this single unconstrained minimization, problem, the solution is also the original constraint problem. This is really greedy, right? We, we, uh, we are expecting, uh, are really, we're really expecting a lot, since we're hoping that solving a constraint, unconstrained problem will give us a solution for the, const for the constraint problem. That's you're often too good to be true. But uh, uh, what we're going to say here is that, well, if this is possible, then it's very likely that this penalty function is non-differentiable, meaning that we cannot easily do this minimization problem uh, itself, even if it's unconstrained, since the p is not differentiable. Uh, the reason is, uh, this is because of the proposition we can make here. Suppose the gamma, uh, suppose the constraint set, constraint set is convex, and the x star is on the boundary of the constraint, so mean, meaning that the optimal point is found on the boundary of this omega, uh, and there exists one, just need one, feasible direction d, such that the inner product of d and the green f and x star is greater than zero, then such an exact penalty p must be non-differentiable. Okay, so it says that even if this penalty, exact penalty function can, can be found, then it's very likely that this p is not differentiable. And then in this case, we cannot apply the gradient method. Okay, why this is true? It's pretty simple uh, uh, proof by contra contradiction. Uh, if, uh, if this is not true, if it's differentiable, then uh, we must be able to find this equal to zero because uh, within the, with, among all the points within the, in the omega, the px is equal to zero. Uh, and so the green of p at x will be also equal to zero. And then when they converge, when, when the x goes to x star, say for example here, this is the omega, 
and this is the word x star. And I know that the p of x will be zero here. So the gradient will be zero. Sorry. Gradient will be zero here. And then um, so the gradient at this point must be zero as well. Right? Gradient of p at this point must be zero as well. So that's why we have that. And then let's consider the uh, let's say that uh, this p is a exact finality. And so that we can just solve this or minimize this. Uh, we call this gx. Okay, and hopefully we can just uh, minimize this to get the minimizer x star for the original constraint problem. But what happens is that if your g is defined in this way, then the gradient of g, so we are trying to minimize this g uh, to find the minimizer. So to find that, let's say the gradient of g is equal to the gradient of f plus gamma times the gradient of p, and this becomes that. And the gradient of p is zero, so we just have this left. Well, now the uh, the feasible for any feasible for a feasible direction d that we have here for the, that feasible direction d the d times the g x star is equal to the d times the gradient f because these two are equal so you multiply d on the two, on the left they will be equal and if this is a positive that means the x star there exists a feasible direction such that this is greater than zero. And this means that x star cannot be a minimizer or local minimizer of the g. That means that you have the gx, uh, but this x star definitely not definitely not a minimizer of this. That means you are not you cannot expect to to minimize this g of x to get the solution x star that satisfies or that solves the original constraint problem. Okay, because this is greater than zero. That violates the first order necessary condition for a minimizer of this g. Okay, so finally, uh, let's look at example why, uh, what that means. So we minimize, for example, we're trying to minimize this function, f minus uh, this objective function, just a one-dimensional case, subject to constraint that x is between 0 and 1. Well, it's a pretty easy function. Let's see. So this is a uh, 0, 1, and the function looks like that, something like this. Okay, I guess this is a still negative, so this is still 2, this is a 5. So within this, apparently the function looks like that, so the minimizer should be here, should be at x equals 1. Okay, apparently it's a, a minimizer, but this minimizer is on the boundary because this is the omega. Okay, and now we look at the f prime, the gradient of f at a star, that is equal to negative three, since we take the gradient of this, it becomes negative three. And the negative three is the same, it's a negative value, so it is aligned with the feasible direction negative one. Okay, so this is the feasible direction, and the gradient is also on this direction. Okay, so they are aligned. And this satisfies the constraint, uh, the condition we have in the previous proposition. And then you can show that there is no way to find a differentiable uh, exact penalty function uh, because if we find a one, then this penalty function we call the p will satisfy the p prime equals to zero. Okay, because it's a, if you assume it's differentiable and it is also a penalty function, that means it's equal to zero. The derivative of this is equal to zero. And then we look at that, the gx equal to that, then we take the derivative, it's just as we did in the proof of the proposition in the previous slide, this is equal to this, and this is negative three, this is zero. So we just have negative three, which is non zero. And this means that the, the x star equals to one cannot be a minimizer of this g. Right? It's just because the g prime is negative three along the negative gradient along the uh, feasible direction, that is not uh, uh, a zero. So that means it doesn't, the x star doesn't satisfy the first order necessary condition for g, so it cannot be a minimizer of g. So when we find the minimizer of g, it's not the x star. It's not the x star that we wanted. Okay, and this means that p cannot be an exact, an exact hypotenuse function. Well, this just said that if it's not differentiable, then we cannot, uh, it cannot be. But if it's non-differentiable, 
then uh, we can still have an exact penalty function such that the, by minimizing this, we can get exactly the, the x star uh, solving the original constraint problem. Okay, and that's one. And the other one is that if uh, for any feasible direction, this is still less than or equal to zero, then again, we don't have this condition in the proposition. And in this case, we will still be able to find a penalty, exact penalty function p that is also differentiable. Okay, that's the uh, that's what this uh, proposition said. Should actually be uh, under certain conditions, we can show that the exact penalty function has to be non-differentiable, but this only under certain conditions. Okay, so that's the uh, example here.